I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is the philosophical equations of economics. These books are available free online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson, who graduated from Yale, has an MA from Tufts, an MBA from Wharton, and he's retired from the investment banking industry. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of concepts being used in current media and examine how they're being used and offer an explication of their essence. This week the, co the topic was going to be the Obamacare uh, fiasco with the Catholic Church. Uh, the Catholic Church has filed suits on percent, uh, uh, contraception coverage. And so uh, this has just actually uh, recently uh, been uh, effectuated and now the Catholic Church have to comply with the contraception of, in, uh, of being having to provide contraception to the uh, to the employees of its charities. So let's go and uh, explore this issue a little bit. First of all, let me make comment that the First Amendment restricts the government ability to prohibit the free exercise of religion. But what does free exercise mean is not self-defining. There are four areas where the state must permit practice of a religion. But when the practice of religion runs into the laws of general applicability, the laws of general applicability tend to win, and they have tended to win since the 1970s. Classic example are the Native Americans who claimed that the use of peyote was essential to the practice of their religion, despite general drug laws. This exercise is not protected by the, the First Amendment, according to the Supreme Court, although the Congress did pass a statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, in response to this. In this case, as I understand it, the Catholic groups are arguing that HHS defined the limitations on the mandate too narrowly and that the First Amendment protects their right to not pay for a, a abortion and contraception, essentially. One key issue is whether there is a meaningful difference between the actual practice of religion and its efficiency. For example, the Catholic diocese, which I believe is exempt. And organizations that are affiliated with it or run by the church or its diocese. Catholic, such as Catholic hospitals, universities, Catholic charities, etc. There is a second argument under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, where Congress has said that laws should not be passed really essentially being bullying religions if it's very difficult for them to, to apply uh, the law. So, as I understand it, so let's go to uh, let's go to outline the situation. First of all, in forming a religion, you've got the beliefs and you formulate the beliefs, and from the beliefs become religious tenets. A religion is formed. <coughs> church is formed, and then often <coughs> within the tenets are instructions, and many religions have these, to go out and, and do good in society. And the Catholic Church, being a 
part of a world famous uh, uh, religious outfit. They've created charities as well they should, as well as uh, because their tenets dictate that uh, this is to be, in order to become a good Catholic, they should do good. And this is beneficial to society. So they create their charities. They go out and they have their help the poor. Um, comes from their the commandments in the Bible and, and doing things good as they're commanded. And, and uh, uh, charities, uh, to their charities, they build hospitals, and universities, schools. They put out food kitchens for the And there are many other charities that they're involved in, all of which are really good for their religion, it's, just, it's religious goodness, and it's also societal goodness, and they coexist. But at the transfer from charity to action, and let me, let me point out, that when you do this, this is where freedom really becomes into the equation. For example, Congress shall not make any laws abridging the freedom of religion. That's the First Amendment. And it uses the word freedom. So I guess we have to define freedom in order to really clarify the situation. Freedom here is the establishment of priorities, and secondly, the effectuation of priorities. So what's a priority? Well, a priority is information that comes into memory and then is attached to it something of importance to yourself. So when, it, uh, so when something was recognized as important, that's a priority, so when attached to a piece of information, then it becomes a piece of knowledge. And the effectuation of that knowledge into with an action, then you have freedom. So let's say you, uh, you decide that uh, you, uh, you're hungry and uh, you'd like an ice cream cone, the thought of itself is the first half of freedom. If the ice cream cone is important to you, you decide that you want it, it will satisfy hunger, but you don't really have freedom until you can walk across the street, go into the ice cream store, and purchase it. So, it's the thought of it, the priority attached to that thought, becomes, becomes knowledge that you want an ice cream, then it's an action is formed, you go across the street, freedom. You can, we can say that you had the freedom to go and get an ice cream cone. So let's go back to our chart here and our progression of the beliefs and how they're transferred from step to step, from religion into charity, into the, into the actions of the charities which are the hospitals, the universities, the schools, etc. But also here, you'll run into societal laws, such as a charity when it builds a hospital and employs somebody, or let's say uh, they, uh, uh, when they, uh, they have to give a W-2 and they comply with the IRS regulations of paying uh, the uh, taxes and have them taken out of the, of the paychecks. That's a societal law, and obviously the charities want to uh, uh, it doesn't conflict with the charity. They're trying to bring their religious uh, tenants uh, to the hospital. And societal laws, such as withholding tax, doesn't the two priorities do not conflict. The benefit of the society, as here, as the is that they're going to get money 
from the hiring of an individual who's going to do work in the hospital or at the university, a teacher who's going to teach at the hospital, he gets uh, uh, decided we uh, receive some pay, to the, uh, which is paid to the government. Obviously, the government benefits, and we want a government. So everybody's happy. There are no conflicts. However, with the contraception issue, societal laws has come into a conflict with the religious tenets which have followed this course. It runs, the government interdicts here and says that action will now, cannot, no longer tra make transfer into the manifestation of the, of, the, of the goodness that they want to bring to society. So let's go one step further. Here we are. We have the moral goodness. The religious, all the three major religions. There are probably some other, but the first three, of course, that, that emanate from uh, the Old Testament, from the from Scripture. Jew, Jew, uh, the Jewish religion, the Christian religion, the Muslim religion, all emanating from... Uh, original scripture, they all have this moral goodness within uh, their beliefs, and so this codification uh, goes into a church, and as we just explained, <coughs> and gets to the manifestation of the, of the charities, which has, which, and, the, and the laws that are applicable to these charities as they run, of course, are made by the government. And they do that, and the government does that because it wants to promote societal goodness. So here we have a conflict between moral goodness and societal goodness. And in the case of the of the Catholic Church suit against the government, the claim here is that the moral goodness transfers and there is no societal goodness because this existed before the goodness of society. After all, the point here is whether having to provide contraceptives in their insurance policy should trump the moral goodness as it transfers into society. One last point before we turn to our panelists. Let's take a look at some of these tenets coming from the religion of the from the various religions. For example, the Ten Commandments. All the religions say we are to believe in, in the Lord thy God and in the Ten Commandments. You notice that the first four are about the relationship between the more the, the goodness, the religious goodness of the individual's relationship with God. Thou shalt make no other gods, no graven images of likeness. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath. But from then on, it becomes societal goodness as well as religious goodness and moral goodness. The moral goodness of the religion pervades into the second half. Honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Bear false witness. Shall not covet. These are societal goods. So with that said, let's bring Rick in to, uh, to talk about this. Rick, what are your uh, what are your comments about the uh, the suit against the government by the Catholic Church regarding the contraception issue within the insurance policies? Well, I'm not a Catholic, but my first reaction is one has to be proud of the Catholics for standing up for that principle, uh, namely that of being able to exercise 
religious freedom and all that that implies in the face of a government that seems determined to spread uh, federal authority over a broader and broader part of the citizenry's lives. Um, there, was, there was an interesting article in the uh, National Review recently by Yuval Levin uh, called The Hollow Republic. And what he talks about there is the assumption for hundreds of years in the United States has been that, well, you had the federal government, the state government, uh, you had the citizen, citizenry, and as you mentioned, in between were these various layers of organizations, churches, civic organizations, business organizations, Boy Scouts, numerous layers that knit the society together on a voluntary basis. You don't volunteer to become part of the federal government's uh, infrastructure. You are automatically forced into it by virtue of the fact that you're a citizen. You can vote, but you, by contrast, you can choose which church to belong to. You can choose which business club to belong to. You can choose any of these other uh, social organizations that knit the society together. What I find striking about this latest move by Obama's government is that it is so uh, blatant in its assumption that these organizations don't matter that they are the they're, they're falling in the ash pile of history and that ultimately the relationship between the government will be one of will be foremost one of a federal government never even mind the states they're becoming very secondary as well in this regime it'll be the relationship between the federal government and the citizen that matters and What's coming on the back of that, of course, is a buildup of government infrastructure, the likes of which we've never seen to the point where it's cover, uh, costing more than a quarter of GDP now, and with no end in sight under the o Obama regime. The government will continue to grow faster than the economy with no end in sight. The uh, Notre Dame uh, put out a statement uh, a couple months ago, and they said the government cannot justify its decision to force Notre Dame to provide, pay for, and or facilitate access to these services in violation of sincerely held religious beliefs. The Notre Dame lawsuit argues, if, and I quote, if the government can force religious institutions to violate their beliefs in such a manner, there is no apparent limit to the government's power. And clearly, if we take a look at this graph and our explanations here, they have interdicted the freedom of religion because it extends the tenets for religious goodness and societal goodness have gone right through, and there are no objections, really. There has never been any objection by the American people uh, for, against the Catholic Church with their formation, of, with, their, with their calling for no, uh, for their parishioners to not use contraceptive. It's not really an argument. You can attend the Catholic Church, and this goes back to your statement that it is voluntary. You can attend the Catholic Church if you want to, and be subject to that tenant, religious tenant, or you can go to another church which doesn't subject you 
to the that tenant because you have a voluntary decision and it is your freedom to exercise that decision. So do you think the, uh, the Notre Dame statement is, uh, is on the side of uh, the righteous, as it were? Well, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a clear statement of fact. There is, it seems, uh, under the Obama regime, no limit to potential government authority over, over one's life. And what's disturbing, I suppose, uh, is that there aren't more churches and more civic organizations protesting alongside the Catholic Church because, you know, the, the end game is clear. They will be affected as well. If not now, it'll be in the future with some other sort of regulation that comes out because, uh, you know, it's an endless stream. And I think that that kind of speaks to the moral bankruptcy of certain religious, particularly organized religious institutions in the United States now, where they've kind of accepted this inferior role and that it's going to become more inferior over time. Uh, some commentators have said uh, and speaking of the Anglican Church, of, of which I'm a member, that one of the reasons uh, Anglican Church membership continues to decline year after year after year is the fact that it doesn't take a stand, that it doesn't engage in these sort of uh, crucial, fundamental arguments between the state versus uh, civic organizations or religious organizations. And I, I think that's absolutely correct. The key to maintain the vitality of religions in this country is to support their diversity and support their right to practice what they preach. Yeah. Um, uh, also uh, noted in a, uh, in a Wall Street Journal article, by uh, Lu uh, Lois Radnowski, she uh, noted uh, toward the end of the article uh, that some First Amendment legal experts say the lawsuits face a slim chance of success. Adam Winkler, a constitutional law professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, pointed to a 1990 Supreme Court decision Employment Division versus Smith that established that groups cannot cite their religion as an excuse to disregard generally applicable laws. Now, also in 1990, Justice Scalia reminded us that making, quote, the professed doctrines of religious, of religious belief superior to the law of the land would mean allowing every citizen to become a law unto itself. So there's a conflict going on, and, and scholars seem to indicate that the Catholic Church is going to lose, at least on the point of the clash with societal laws with the First Amendment. Are these legal scholars correct, or are, 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 or are, we, uh, are we somehow deficient in being able to um, understand the issues involved? What, what do you think, Rick? Well, if something like this ends up in the Supreme Court or a court at that, that kind of level, a uh, federal level, it's, it's, it's often difficult to understand the outcomes. And we saw recently that the Supreme Court court upheld Obamacare, and how many legal experts came out uh, suggesting that it was more than likely that Obamacare's, or at least a part of Obamacare, would fall uh, under that recently announced decision, and it didn't, or not in any material way. Um, so I, I don't put much store in what 
the legal experts say because i mean there there's there are technicalities that can be struck down but there are there are also broad principles that may be upheld and that may carry the day so i think it's too early to say one way or the other it depends on which federal court this ends up in or whether it goes to the supreme court and i just think it's too early to tell okay um one other paragraph in that article states that uh others including notre dame law professor richard garnett say the suits may be able to be successfully drawn on the religious freedom restoration act which we mentioned earlier here in the program of 1993 which requires the federal government to consider the rights of religious groups when crafting a policy uh that's a kind of a rely on a secondary issue but i still think the primary issue should be the supreme court should consider the philosophical problems here in that there's a clash between the moral goodness and society wants is the moral goodness of religion and that's why the first amendment exists to pervade all the way through to the end and when it's rush, made rush out over by government interdiction, this government interdiction is wrong, especially when there's a precedent for that moral goodness, such as this one we're speaking of in the Catholic Church, pervading all the way through, through most of the history of the United States until now, and suddenly the government goes, eh, no, 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 we, uh, we, we're going to uh, override that part. I think here, the moral goodness should trump the goodness, the style of the goodness that government interdiction here is pretending to provide to the outcomes of the charities of the religion. And that's about all the time we have today on the philosophical angle. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.